welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we're in the middle of our series on the Ten Commandments, and we're talking about the Fifth Commandment today, and specifically the metaphysics of fatherhood. Why does God tell us to honor our father and mother? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a blunt way to open it. Yeah, right. well, I mean, just like, you know... Is it no. obvious or is it not obvious? Or what's wh- what's this fatherhood thing anyway? What's this fatherhood thing and what do we have to do with it? The title is The Metaphysics of Fatherhood. That sounds um, vague, philosophical, and impressive. <laughs> or hoity <laughs> Probably because it was meant to. Uh, when we come to the Ten Commandments, you know, backing up uh, about 30 years. I remember my pastor's sons coming to me and saying, you know, we, 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 we like a Bible study, you know, just on obvious practical stuff that everyone, no one ever talks about. Like, why 10 commandments? Why these 10? Why in this order? And I said, well, I think I can answer that if you actually really want to have a Bible study. I don't think we ever did. But that was a long time ago. And I think since then, I understand even better why these commandments. In fact, right now, I am writing a series that I've imaginatively called Christ in the Ten Commandments, because I couldn't think of a better title. (laughs) Uh, But when we come here, there's a lot of things that seem obvious. Okay, well, yeah, obeying fathers, that's a good thing. I mean, family, it's central to to society and civilization. Everybody knows that. We probably should have children obeying their parents. I mean, that's just common sense, natural law, rational thinking, all of that. And is there really any more to it? Well, covenantally speaking, it's the it's the fifth commandment, and thus corresponds to the fifth point of a covenant outline, which is continuity, inheritance, uh, succession, honor the past, the authority, the wisdom of the past, with an eye to the future. It's the point of cultural or covenantal trans- transition and um, translation. We're here sitting in our generation. We hope there's one that comes after us. How are we going to get there? Well, if we are, if we as parents are not honorable and they as children don't honor us, we're kind of going to drop dead in a given generation. So you can argue that way. And, and that's true. All of those things are true to a point. But the, the problem with all of these commandments is when we start from our own experience or from our own reason or from what everybody knows rather than from scripture itself when we when we start poking around the bible it doesn't take us long to find out that the bible calls god a father more particularly it calls the first person of the trinity father and the second person son so fatherhood and sonship are things eternal in god himself and these are not economic titles that is Temporary relationships work out in history for our benefit, but Father, Jesus is God's only begotten Son. He's he's always been begotten. He always is the begotten Son of God. It's a timeless act. It's an eternal act. Because if there's no Son, there's no Father. If there's no Father, there's no Son. Father and Son kind of imply each other, and although uh, we have to be careful on the limits of human language when we start talking about the very essence of and being of God, we, on the other hand, have to confess that when God says things, they are true things. And although we may not be able to plumb and exhaust the depth of their meaning, there, there are some things that are true. The son really is a son. The father really is a father. And that relationship is archetypical. That relationship is eternal. And when God made us, when he made man in his image, and, and introduced into humanity, into creation, this idea of fatherhood, sonship. Uh, he's reflecting something in himself. And so as we, as we look at this relationship, which I, I suppose we're going to do here for a little while, it, it becomes clearer why it's such a big deal and, and why it matters so tremendously much. It's not simply because, oh, look at the consequences of not doing it. It's more like, and because it's so important to God, he rigged the universe necessarily, so those consequences are inevitable, uh, we, may, we may not defy God and, and hope that there will be no consequences. The universe, both in cause and effect, reflects him when we, 
when we conform ourselves to the image of God, the universe is on our side. When we when we war against that, the universe isn't on our side, and and bad things happen. And we we really shouldn't have to point that out, nor should it be something to argue about. You think we can get away with defying our parents and everything will be okay? <laughs> no, I don't think that at all. And neither does any other sane person for various reasons, of course. So that's what we're looking at. And with that in mind, I want to read a line from um, from Bavink. This is from his um, The Doctrine of God, which I think I've recommended before. It's the one best single volume on theology proper that I've ever seen. And he says this of, of the Father begetting the Son. It is an act of eternal and immutable. It is an act, I'm sorry, it is an act eternal and immutable, eternally finished, yet continuing forevermore. As it is natural for the Son to give light and for the fountain to pour forth water, so it is natural for the Father to generate the Son. The Father is not, nor ever was, without generating. He begets everlastingly. And so again, we stand back and say, that ah, didn't make sense. There's contradictions there, because <laughs> it's eternally finishing, yet eternally continuing. Yes, let us remember that eternity, by definition, is timeless. <laughs> We don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Where is that written? <laughs> I think it's when God, I think when in the beginning God created heavens and earth. So the, again, the, the limitations of language and understanding, and, and yet truth at the same time. Of course we believe that God's being is such that we can't get it all in our net. And at the same time, as I said before, we do truly confess, as the church always had, that the words are not without meaning. They are bounded by all the other words that also have meaning. We know, for instance, that God does not have a physical body, and this begetting is not a physical, physiological, biological kind of fathering as we compare Scripture with Scripture. And yet there's something there. There's something in the very nature of God, not forced upon him from the outside, not adopted voluntarily at some point in his existence from within, but something of what it means for God to be God. God is Father. That's what God is. That's who God is. God is Son. He's both. And he's and and he is Father and Son to the point that the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father, and they talk to each other. They communicate to each other. They breathe the Spirit back and forth to each other. They are distinct while yet being two persons of that being we call God. And as we then look at this relationship, we can begin to get some ideas of, of what fatherhood is in God without exhausting it and without nailing down everything we might like to know. And from that, begin to draw some wisdom. And feel free to jump in here anytime you want. <laughs> Let me read from, uh, from Bavink again. Speaking of God, Bavink says, He is not an abstract, distinctionless unity. In himself is fullness of life. His nature is a generative, fruitful essence. It is capable of unfoldment and communication. Whoever denies that divine fecundity does not figure with the truth that God is infinite, blessed life, all such a person has left is an abstract, deistic idea of God. In order to supply the deficiency thus brought about, he now, in pantheistic fashion, incorporates into the being of God the life of the universe. Apart from the idea of the Trinity, the act of creation becomes inconceivable. If God is absolutely incommunicable, he is a darkened light, a, a dry spring. How then would it be possible for him to impart himself to his creatures? Hmm. There's a lot to chew on in that. Yeah. Uh, and I will not say that I've mastered it all, but uh, some things. Life. Life is 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 growth and personality and change, depending on what kind of life. When we talk about plant life, but the Bible really doesn't recognize that as life. It it looks at those things that are living souls into whom God breathed the breath of life, animals and man. And of course, man is God's image in a different category. But there is movement and rest. There is thought and emotion. 
there is distinction, there is reproduction even, there is growth. Now, the, here, here's the thing, God doesn't change. How does that apply to God? And I think at some point we say, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't completely understand how that works. And then we're back to why is the eternal generation of the Father ever finished, ever continuing? Well, if it started at some point, then God would have changed. If it ended at some point, God would have changed. If it is complete from eternity, okay, well, maybe God can understand that. I don't think we can. But then this, this life and love and, and, and generating no longer exists as a thing in God. In fact, in a sense, it never did. It's something that was already there and already finished. And yet God keeps keeps proclaiming that he's life. He has life in himself. He, the Father gives to the Son, and he has life in himself. And how do we keep that from, our conception of that, rather, from devolving back into God as some kind of stasis field, where he just is? Mm -hmm. And we're left as moving, thinking, feeling creatures trying to relate to what is, in essence, a static field of unthinking, unmoving intelligence caught, maybe caught in a single thought forever and ever. It's, there, there are some dangers there. Theologians need to be really careful when they tiptoe around this and not make grand sweeping statements, especially when they reject what the creeds and the confessions have said. Well, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. We don't need Nicaea. Uh... Yeah, you're, 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 you're the reason we need Nicaea. <laughs> Because yeah. people come along and say, my, what my net can't catch isn't fish. And, um, and and what inevitably happens when we try to rationalize God is we end up with a fake God. We end up with God as an idea mm -hmm. or, or a static force or just a thing that's sitting out there, that our Aristotle's unmoved mover thinking eternally about itself, but never doing anything and never moving and never speaking and never communicating. <laughs> At which point, recognizing that the universe is a thing after all, and this God person's out there doing something, if he's even a person, then what? Do we deify the universe and kick God out of it? Do we try to blend God into the universe in pantheistic fashion, as Bob Inc. suggests? Can God communicate at all? And if he can't, how? what good is he to us? Because we're selfish creatures. We're not, well, what does that have to do with me? If God's locked in on himself, not much. The, the phrase I've used a lot lately is God is the self-revealing God. Mm -hmm. God reveals himself in his son, who is his very image. And the father and son breathe forth the spirit as true emanations, expressions, the breath of who they really are. And, and the spirit's not a thing. He's not a force. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is divine life. Uh, and so God unfolds and reveals himself constantly, eternally. And when we look at that and now glance down at creation and say, and fathers beget sons. Okay, we're kind of on to something, but that's why we need the rest of scripture to guide us because we can come up with all kinds of weird things mm -hmm. off that one. Yeah, you you posited the question uh, a few minutes ago, if God is this abstracted static field of some sort, how do we relate to him? And I mean, the answer to that has to be in God's self-revelation, in his covenant, mm -hmm. that we we know how to relate to him because he's told us how. Um, and one of the ways he's told us how is in these Ten Commandments that we're going through um, in their context and in the person of Christ. So why don't we look at said person of Christ? Um you had a passage from Mark that, yeah. where he talks about honoring one's father. Yeah, I'll, I'll read. This is Mark chapter 7, and this is where the rubber meets to ro the road, as it were. Then came unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. So what's going on here is not that the disciples had dirty hands and hadn't washed it, so they had not gone through the ritual purifications that the Talmud required. And the Pharisees are very upset about this. They, the, the disciples are violating the tradition of the fathers. So this is a chapter about how you relate to your fathers. 
But the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off to eat, not holding the tradition of the, of the elders. And when they uh, come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received a hold as the, the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and tablets. And the Pharisees and the scribes ask, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, that is, the fathers of past generations, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Now, what the Pharisees are doing here is suggesting that Jesus is a bad father figure, rabbi, leader of these guys, because he's getting, he's letting them get away with neglecting, disobeying the tradition of the Jewish fathers, the elders who in past generations had laid down these principles and the Pharisees had elevated to religion. Now, the Pharisees on another occasion had already accused Jesus of being a friend of sinners, a wine bibber, and a, and a um, drunkard or a glutton. Glutton and wine, and a glutton and drunkard is an allusion to the law of Deuteronomy, whose chapter I have here someplace, Deuteronomy 21 20, where a rebellious son can be executed if the parents are willing to bring him to the elders and say, This our son is rebellious, he is a drunkard and a glutton. Uh, and and so when the Pharisees had said that earlier, there was a context where they were saying that Jesus was basically a rebellious son, a juvenile delinquent who should have been executed years ago, but his parents obviously were too tender to do the right thing and value God's kingdom more than this, this son of theirs. Mm -hmm. And so we're coming back again. Is, is Does Jesus respect the fifth commandment? Well, he answers them and says, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it's written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? So he's quoting Isaiah, who kind of predates the fathers. He's <laughs> uh, going back to a real church father. And then Jesus goes on, For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and, and many other such things you do. And he said unto them, full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. And now Jesus appeals to the fifth commandment. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother. And now he also appeals to one of the case laws connected with the fifth commandment. And this is Exodus 21, 17. He that curses his father or mother, let him die the death. Hmm. Um, usually when we think of the... Um, the laws, the mosaic laws against juvenile delinquency, we think of the one in Deuteronomy. But Moses had said it when the Ten Commandments were given, or God had said it through Moses, that if a son curses his father and mother, or if he hits his father and mother, he should be executed. The passage in Deuteronomy is more lengthy and uh, puts some conditions on it, but also lays out greater possibilities. Uh, the parents have to testify that they have discipled him and disciplined him, and that as a child they spank him. They can't simply say, yeah, we let him grow up, however, and now he's a complete monster, so would you kill him for us, please? And you can't do that. <laughs> they have then failed to be honorable and to deserve honor. And so they have to be, they have to look the elders in the eye and say these things. But furthermore, there's the implication that if they can bring their son to execution, they could have brought him for a whipping long before this, and a spanking even earlier if they couldn't pull it off. Uh, there is a point where the civil government does have a function in dealing with juvenile delinquents, and we would hope that it never gets as far as that final um, possibility of execution. And yet, having said that, Jesus endorses the, the, the previous case law in Exodus. Whoso curseth his father and mother, let him die the death. Uh, it's this is the kind of thing we don't want to hear from Jesus. Jesus would never be that cruel and unkind and unreasonable. I'm sure Jesus would never, if Jesus had children, he never would have spanked them. I mean, that would all be figure of speech, right? Uh, Jesus is talking about executing young men, probably 20-somethings, if they strike out at their parents or if they, if they curse them. He's very serious. He's not, this is not hyperbole. This is not hypothetical. He is, he is endorsing one of those case laws that American Christians and liberals often find the most offensive of, of all. 
Now, he says, that's what, that's what Moses said. That's what God said. Now, here's what you say. If a man say to his father or his mother, it is korban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited from me, he shall be free. So here's what the Pharisees taught. Yes, you should take care of mom and dad when they're old. But if you, if God has laid it upon your heart to give your stuff to God, you can do that. You can give it all to God, sign it off. It's no longer yours. You, uh, uh, Sorry, you can't use it to help mom and dad. Some other sibling will have to take care of that because it's God's. <laughs> However, as the manager of this uh, large amount of money, you are certainly entitled to expense account and to meet your daily bills because otherwise, well, then someone else would have to do it. Then we have to pay them. We might as well pay you. So you, it, it's all it's all God's for you to use, but your parents can't have any. <laughs> A gift, korban. And Jesus says, uh, and you suffer him, permit him, no more to do aught for his father and mother, nothing for his father and mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things you do. It's like a corrupt tax write-off. <laughs> yeah. That's yes. what it sounds like. <laughs> and yeah, like you were saying, it's just uh, he he keeps appealing backwards to people bef the, who come logically and genealogically prior to these commands that they follow you know like yeah. you said first he quotes uh the prophet and then he quotes god yeah <laughs> <laughs> by way of moses by way of yeah. moses yeah, so going, who are the fathers first. that they are appealing to that the pharisees are like the, what when did this tradition exilic fa fathers i imagine yeah yeah okay yeah so those those who came online once the what we call the 400 silent years began the hellenistic age um, and not to say that they were all bad, but some of it was bad and some of it had been built upon and some of it had been idolized. And the Pharisees were really good at picking out the things that created huge loopholes for them to indulge their lust. We, I got a lot of money. I want to keep it. I don't care mom and I don't care about mom and dad. Someone else can take care of them. Oh, if I just put a tag on it that says for God, I can do whatever I want. Sounds good to me. And I can claim that I am holier than you because I just gave all my stuff to God. What have you done for him lately? Wonderful sleight of hand. <laughs> but th this is Jesus um, endorsing the fifth commandment, not as a matter of tradition or social convenience or, you know, this is what will keep society going and therefore we ought to do it. Uh, he's appealing to the law of the prophets. This is what God has said. And God is so serious, he backed it up with a death penalty. And this is uh, within a few years of Jesus himself dying the death of yes. one that has cursed his father, even yes. though he never did. Even though he never did. So the, the, the roots then of this whole um, father-son thing are in God, and God reveals himself, as you said, Emily, he the Ten Commandments are an outflowing of who he is. They're not, God didn't look around the universe and say, I gotta have something for these guys to do. What would be good? What would be good? Um, yeah, okay. Oh, I can give them stuff and they shouldn't take it. Yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> all those little pictures of me, I, I've never liked those, so I won't do that. <laughs> oh, this thing when they beget one another, yeah, that's, who wants to go through all that? Well, maybe if I sanctify it with a commandment. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> so I, most people don't even give it that much thought. They just know, they just say, you know, these are the commandments. No, most people don't know what the commandments are. <laughs> Try this sometime because I do, anytime I, I do uh, an entrance exam for students coming into high school, and I'm only doing this on 11th graders or 12th graders, juniors and seniors. One of the questions is something like, what are the first, third, and ninth commandments? Hardly anybody gets it right. Usually they leave a blank. They don't know what they are. And I remember a, a skit on TV. I don't even, it's probably Saturday Night Live or something like that. But uh, some uh, character was playing an extreme right wing American military general type, you know, full of morality and something, mm -hmm. could never seem to get the commandments right. And he kept confusing them with amendments. <laughs> Third Amendment, 
The Third Amendment is that the one about adultery? <laughs> but you know, even even Saturday Night Live or whatever liberal spoof show it was, understood how little people who ch try to champion the Ten Commandments even know them. The average Christian doesn't. So we're not much better than the um, the liberals and the nominal Christians, the Christmas Christians, Christmas, Christmas Easter Christians, who, who who are willing to take the name and say, yeah, Christian morality, that's a pretty good thing. We have no concept of what God actually required because it's, it's just a bunch of random things and they don't see any unity. You know, there's nothing to pull it together to make it cohesive. Oh, like my young friends from years and years ago, why these 10? Why in this order? Well, this this is part of it, because each one of these commandments is a revelation of the Trinitarian nature of God, and particularly the revelation of, of God in Christ, which is the series I'm writing right now. I've just, I finished the, um, you shall have no other gods before my face within my presence. You know, the first time the word presence shows up is in the Garden of Eden. What was it that they saw? What was it they heard as they fled the presence of God? Wasn't it Jesus? Mm. The angel of my presence saved them. That would be, and that's in a Trinitarian formula. Uh, so again, the angel of the presence, the, the revelation of God, God's face toward the universe is the sun. And then the second commandment, and that, that's relevant here, although we're, we're down a bit. Jesus is the image. The son is the eternal image of the father rightness of his glory, the express image of his person, the image of the invisible God. And so as we come here, we're, we're seeing the God revealed as father and son. Now, Emily, your question. What was my question? <laughs> <laughs> Not that question. Is this, is this the question about um, why we haven't talked about mothers yet? That would be it. Oh, why haven't we talked about mothers yet, seeing as how they're <laughs> in the commandment? No. Because we're tracing it back to um, the Trinity in the most obvious way. But then, of course, we have the question, well, what about mothers? Is God mother? We have to say yes and no. Mm -hmm. you got to be very careful here. This is something yeah. we're going to come back to when we get to um, the, the commandment on marriage, which is the seventh. I always have to count. <laughs> um, that For some reason, the seventh and eighth, I always have to count them out. Because, obviously, well, maybe not obviously to some, but if you go back and, look and read Genesis 1 and Genesis 4, both places it says that male and female are the image of God. Mm -hmm. So the woman as a female is the image of God, which means that that particular arrangement of qualities does find its source originally in God, even though Scripture continues to speak of God as he and him and not she. Mm -hmm. But the the more obvious place where we see the male female thing played out, but it's secondary, original. Where we have to keep that the first first. Woman is the image of God. If we let go of that, everything falls apart. Mm -hmm. But it is also true that within marriage, the husband portrays God as as father, as husband, as leader, as champion, and the wife portrays the church as daughter, bride, helper, all of those things. And so the mother comes more clearly into focus. Notice the word clearly. More clearly into focus when we start considering that God has a wife, and that wife is the church. And just as we ought to honor uh, God our Father, who is eternal deity, uh, we also ought to honor our mother, the church. And here you can start with the priesthood of believer, the doctrines of creeds and confessions, church history and traditions, all of that over against the rank individualism of our century, where, well, why, sh why should I listen to these people? They're just guys. It's just their opinion. For the same reason you should listen to your mother. <laughs> and again, remember, I keep, I keep saying it, that's not to say that mom doesn't also reflect the image and glory of God. But there is an added dimension there as well that God begins to flesh out. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at God, none of the persons is ever called mother, but there is that which in God, in God which is most certainly reflected in the mothering thing that mothers do. 
Mm-hmm. And since God has chosen to do it that way, we need to follow him because when we do it, our, when we start doing our own thing, we get ourselves into trouble. Yeah. A couple of years ago, someone asked me, oh, did your church do anything to honor Mother's Day? Because it was mm-hmm. around that time. And I was thinking, I was thinking, and I was like, I think we sang that psalm that says, and yet should mothers, monsters prove and forsake their children, God will still be with us. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was the only mention of mothers during that service. <laughs> <laughs> Does your church celebrate holidays and holy days? Uh, they do Christmas and Easter and sometimes St. Patrick's Day. It's It's a little bit... <laughs> Uh, hodgepodge hodgepodge that's the word yeah, yeah that's fine it's just that there are some churches that in order to make it clear how much they don't buy into <laughs> religious celebrations actually do counter yeah. sermons yeah. and counter hymns <laughs> at that point so just just curious well there's also uh i'm just going to refer to it vaguely because i have a loud keyboard but in any case <laughs> uh, i can think of exact of one which is where where jesus you know t- is yes. talking and says you know uh jerusalem jerusalem who who uh, slays yes. the prophets who sent them how i would have gathered you under my wing like a mother hen yes and you would not yeah it's yeah. being spoken by the son right who come <laughs> as a man but he's still clearly using this uh, this feminine protective, overarching right. wings like a mother language. It it is something that is that's in the character of God and in his yeah. actions, uh, while not being something he necessarily reveals himself as nominatively. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He does not tell us to call him mother, but there is that within him which is the foundation root of motherhood. Because mm-hmm. the alternative is to say it comes from someplace else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then we got problems. Then we got problems. And there's yeah. some other thing out there beyond God and his universe that's inserting stuff. Or we just say that mother with Aristotle chaos. that yeah, mother chaos. We say with Aristotle that women are simply uh, monstrosities and corruptions of male <laughs> oh, nature. <gosh. laughs> and go from there. Because those Greeks, shouldn't we follow them? Because they were right about everything. You know, you hear things approaching that these days. Yeah, I was just thinking, I'm not going to name names, not going to name names. <laughs> We're okay without naming names. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Let the I'm, reader I'm... understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, on, on another front of, of Greekness and such, uh, are you familiar with, um, oh, rats, class co- Crash Course in World History by John Green? There we go. I I'm, am aware of its existence. I've I think you, I've caught a handful of, of videos yeah. just out of interest because it was I covering think, a particular topic. Yeah, I, I think you would enjoy it if you haven't. Uh, he's not a Christian and he's not right about everything, but he's got his head screwed on right. And there's a lot. It, I just watched uh, with uh, the other teachers at school the video, the Renaissance. Was it a thing? <laughs> and. I thought he did a great job <laughs> arguing cool. that he's asking is, the right questions. Yeah, this is the right question. And his his conclusion in the end was sort of depends on what you mean, but <laughs> was it a thing? Do people go out one day and say, Johnny, Mary, stop. Remember this. The Renaissance just dawned. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's amazing. Uh, by and large, no, uh, it did hardly affect anybody unless you were really, really rich or worked for somebody who was really rich and read a lot. And, you know, that's a small minority. Did it have an effect? Sure. Uh, but did it alter medieval society on the spot much? No, not really. But anyway, in, it was at the beginning of that, he was talking about the borrowing of Greek and, and Roman ideas. And he said something that absolutely surprised and amused me. He was referring to Aristotle. Who, who managed to get virtually everything wrong. And he went on. <laughs> I like this guy. Anybody who can say that Aristotle got just about everything wrong deserves to be listened to more than he probably is. As opposed to certain persons who promote forms of <clears throat> Christian education that think that Aristotle is a demigod or something. Oh, dear. Uh, which brings me back to something I was actually thinking of earlier when you were- Christian uh, Platonism. Yeah, yeah right? Uh, no. yeah. The wisdom of God. In Proverbs, mm-hmm. is feminine, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and 
some people have tried to get around that by just saying, well, that's not that's not Jesus. That's just some right. abstract principle. Okay, there's an abstract principle in God that's feminine. That's really not helping your argument a whole lot here. Um, I think they're just th trying to run away from like some kind of liberalistic claim that you know, Jesus is transgender or intersex. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, and, and I can appreciate that, but I think probably digging deeper rather than running away <laughs> would, would be a good start. In so but, many cases. <laughs> in so many cases. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it starts, as Emily has pointed out, with you shall fear. Well, first of all, you fear the Lord. Fear the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. But then the next thing is uh, fear your father and mother. Obey your father. Listen to your mom. It ends with, and here's the great kind of wife you should have. So although there's a lot about it being a father speaking to his son, one of his basic themes throughout is you got to pick the right companions. And ultimately, that means two things. God, God's spirit, Jesus, and two, the woman you're going to marry, and she better, and she better incarnate wisdom. I think that's why uh, wisdom is portrayed as, uh, as feminine, because we have Dame Folly, the whore, mm -hmm. or the sort of whore. And we have the godly wife who appears in the last chapter, and the young man is being guided away from the one toward the other, and wisdom, the wisdom he's going to meet, one would hope that for a young man, the person who exemplifies Christ above everyone else in his life, but perhaps his parents, is the woman he marries. And the guy who says, and I actually had a young man say this to me once, yeah, I, I, I'm. I want to. I'm going to marry this girl because you know she's not all that spiritual and and that she's she's okay with some with some stuff that other people find questionable. So we'll make a good match. Okay. Are you insane or just stupid? Well, he got what he deserved. Honestly, she was everything he thought he was or she was. But I think most of us would say in our spouses we want someone like Jesus. And so the young man in, in Proverbs is directed to someone like Jesus, and she, and that someone is most certainly feminine. And so throughout the book, he's being pointed to wisdom, who is in that sense feminine, as goes over against the lust of the world, exemplified in the, the strange woman. Can we contrast this, since we were on the topic of the Renaissance and paganism and pagan myths, um, let's contrast real fast. Uh, that was a nice we... sleight of hand. I appreciated that sleight of hand. <laughs> Thank you. No. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brian. <laughs> no, I was doing sleight of hand. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> very slight. Um, anyway, as you know, the pagan myths, probably as well as I do, um, in Greek mythology, um, Kronos, wily Kronos, with his side, <laughs> Uh, supplants his father Uranus and castrates him and takes over the universe, only to be told that he himself will also lose his throne to one of his children. And so he swallows them all, except Zeus, for whom a rock is substituted. And Zeus comes and removes Kronos. <laughs> it's like Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, exactly like Indiana Jones, now that you mention it. Because that also was a god being replaced by stone, now that you, that you bring that up. Um, and then there was also uh, Zeus was warned about not so much that that his daughter would uh, supplant him as that she would be smarter than him. So he swallowed the pregnant mom and nonetheless, um, what's her name? Athena sprung full blown from his head, giving him a terrible headache. In the process. <laughs> uh, a lot of our listeners will be more familiar, perhaps, thanks to Marvel movies with Loki, <laughs> who, of course, is the favorite hero of the marvel universe so it seems he gets his own series even after they killed him that somehow doesn't seem fair spoilers yeah um <laughs> but you know loki is uh the son of odin by a giantess and in the end turns on him brings about ragnarok isis turns on Ra, um, deceives him tricks her tricks him into revealing his true name and once she has that, she um, arranges for his dis permanent disability and takes all his power. And, and we could probably trace this through other mythologies insofar as we know them, that this ongoing thing or theme is that you can't trust your kids. Don't care if they're gods or godlings. 
they're going to come back and turn on you. That's just what kids do. Now, that's a very pessimistic attitude toward the universe. And there, there is a book I, I'm going to recommend with caution because I haven't exhausted it. I'm the author in some ways I'm very careful about. But Peter Lightheart wrote a book called um, Dark or Deep Comedy. Deep comedy, Trinity, tragedy, and hope in Western literature, and, I, and I'll, I'll track with him this far at least. In in all of these pagan myths, the moment that the origin, the source, the the original deity, coughs out something, it's a threat. At the very least, it's lesser. It's 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 not. It doesn't measure up to what was beyond. And as emanation follows emanation. We get a degradation in in essence uh, in the ontology of the thing, and the only solution is to climb back to the original source and come together again in in that original thing. Because any departure from the origin is necessarily a um, a depletion, a um, a lessening. Let's see. I think I actually see if I can quote myself here. Any emanation from the original source is necessarily diminished in its essence. The light streams, the light that streams out of the eternal is dimmed, and through further emanation or reflection degrades into darkness. Salvation, even if it's possible, involves a re return to the source and a rejection of the first departure. The soul must return to the eternal, the sparks to the light. There can be no place for history and matter. We must end where we began and forget the nightmare that was creation and history. Isn't this Gnosticism? Yeah. Like cut, paste? Yeah, <laughs> everything, everything is Gnosticism. Yeah. <laughs> everything is Gnosticism. I thought that was a foregone conclusion, yes. uh, but we see, but we see it in these stories, these myths too. Mm -hmm. Any, the gods degenerate. The, the half gods go when the true gods come because the half gods are lame and treacherous and dangerous and always turn on their father. Now consider that as an eschatology. Mm -hmm. Things go down. Things degrade. Things get worse. Now consider what we have in, in God and in his son. God fathers a son and looks into his son and sees himself without diminution, without distortion, and he is well pleased. Mm -hmm. The father can beget the son and lose nothing in the process, and the son is not lesser than the father or in any way a distortion of the father. And so we don't have some kind of um, you could go the other way, nor is he an improvement on the father. Mm -hmm. We don't have some kind of dispensational generation gap where either the son is lesser and we need to get back to the original monotheism or the son is higher and we must reject the father as primitive and set in his ways and someone we can discard. The son completely, perfectly reveals the father. And in that there's hope. And, and it is the nature of God to produce life and the life is not worse it's just as glorious and it's just a little different yes. and building on that then we mm -hmm. have an increase as well in the sons of god so that those who are found to be in christ the father looks at them and also sees christ uh, amen yes excellent yeah the possibility of it being better than it was Although God is all glorious, yet God can play for higher odds, and that's that's the great uh, the great mystery of the ontological Trinity. God is perfectly sufficient, absolutely glorious, needs nothing, can have nothing added to Him, and yet somehow He cheats and does. He <laughs> creates this thing called history yeah. that does glorify Him, and He brings many sons to glory, even though He's already got the best, perfect, complete Son that can't be surpassed. He doesn't add to them. They, he includes these new sons in him so that they are distinct and yet not identical. And yet they are identical because it covenant. Covenant is <laughs> covenant, the cheater there. Lots of covenant. Yes, lots of covenant. All <laughs> uh, right. We keep well, seeing is... things like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of, I think, what this is all about. It's kind of an adventure through scripture with just a, a very few things in our hands and just constantly holding them up and saying, is yep. this, is this yep, you? Is that's this that. you? Oh, wow, another one! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that is the place where we should stop before we go off on another hour-long tangent. 
Not that this has been a tangent, but that we would go on tangents and we simply <laughs> don't have the time. Um, so let's go to recos and we'll be pretty quick about those. Oh, all right. I guess we're in a hurry. I'm going to <laughs> recommend uh, a book by Weldon Hardenbrook called Missing from Action. It's a book about fatherhood. Now, the man is, uh, I think, Antioch and Orthodox and so would reject the double procession of the spirit. I think it comes up kind of backhandedly once, but he's got, he has definitely got his head screwed up, screwed on right. And he's evangelical. Um, there's no doubt about him emphasizing the word of God and sovereign grace and all that. And the book looks at, it was written, it was written quite a while ago when people actually watch network TV, but uh, it goes in fact, probably eighties, maybe. Uh, it goes back, oh, actually I actually have the date here, 87 is when he was writing. So he's looking back on the 80s. And he's looking at the kinds of manhood that were held up to us in cinema and TV and showing us, you know, we have Michael, the Michael Jackson image. We have the Archie Bunker image. We have the, I forget who else, Clint Eastwood or something. And he shows us these various kinds of manhood and says, these aren't biblical. And yet when we talk about being a man, this is what our culture is telling us. And then he does a little historical survey of showing how this, how we got there, taking us back to the Enlightenment and the Romantic movement, the Victorian age, and showing how fathers kind of got kicked out of the house. And we put women on a pedestal and left them there worthy of nothing except, you know, some occasional genuflection. Um, and so they become the dainty fainting thing that we 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 idolize but don't take seriously, while men go out and tackle the world, uh, and leave religion behind. And then he he takes it from there, and he and he ends with some serious discussion of, biblically speaking, what does it mean to be a father? Mm. And I think there's some really good stuff that our generation could stand to hear. Are the Antiochian Orthodox part of general Eastern Orthodoxy? Yeah, there's yeah. That's... But they they look to Antioch rather than to um, Moscow or Byzantium. I guess I don't know exactly how that works. I don't know either. But it, it's interesting that you you mentioned uh, his confirmation of like sovereign grace because that's a thing that the Eastern Orthodox are very very against as yeah. far as well. I say sovereign grace. Maybe I should just say evangelical grace. He sounds like your typical solid American evangelical. Interesting. I don't, That's also I don't, interesting. Yeah, well, it, it is. It, it's the, uh, in fact, I think the name of the denomination is the Evangelical Orthodox hmm. or Evangelical Antioch. I don't know what it's called. I don't have the book in front of me. Sure thing. Sure but, thing. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I very much recommend the book. It's got a lot of wisdom. All right. Cool. Brian? Yes. Um, I'm going to recommend a book that I. I've been doing most of my quote unquote reading via audiobook from the library lately, which still has counts been marvelous <laughs> because I can still listen to it and understand it, but like clean my room at the same time. It's awesome. <laughs> um, and so the, what I listened to this weekend is Dostoevsky's The Idiot, which mm -hmm. is a phenomenal novel. And I'm going to recommend it to you all because it's fun mm -hmm. and depressing because it's Russian, um, <laughs> but it's very nasty. good. It's very good. All right. Great. Um, my recommendation is a lecture from Vody Bakum, who I'm not super familiar with, but I've heard his name a lot and he always comes highly recommended. The lecture is called why you can believe the Bible. I watched this on Wednesday with some friends and he just does a really great job of um first of all analyzing the question that often gets put to christians just entering college by unbelieving professors mm. who think it's their job to take down <laughs> all the teaching that christian parents have done <laughs> in the world um so he does a wonderful job in particular of balancing well acknowledging up front that this is a question about ultimate authority and ultimate how we know what we know. And so if we answer with anything besides the Bible, mm -hmm. we've just denied that the Bible is actually the ultimate authority. Right. So, um, so he says that up front and then digs into, okay, and here's what the Bible says and how it's backed up sort of with the concrete 
facts and history. And, you know, this is a reliable collection of historical documents. And he has this whole line that he goes through. Um, he's drawing from First Peter, I want to say. I have the passage in my head. I can not see where it is on the page. <laughs> not but, followed cunningly devised fables? No. Um, holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit? The, the part leading up to that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have a, <laughs> we have a more a, a surer word of prophecy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that whole passage. I think it's First Peter chapter 2. But mm -hmm. anyway, if you listen to the lecture, you'll find out exactly what the passage is, and you'll get to hear Vodi Bakum exposit it, which I highly recommend. And what is, again, is the name of the lecture, and where might one find it? The lecture is called Why You Can Believe the Bible. It was given at Antioch Bible Church. Um, so if you search... Vodibakum, if you know how to spell his name, you can search that. Um, but if you search <laughs> why you can believe the Bible, Antioch Bible Church, it'll mm -hmm. come up. Or any sort of alternate phrasing of the question. I searched <laughs> a couple different ways because I couldn't remember what it was called and it came up. So um, okay. I'll also put a link in the show notes as Oh, well, that would help. Yeah. yeah. All the links to all the things will be in the show notes as well. Okay. So thank you guys so much. It's been a great evening. Thank you. Thanks also to David, our producer, my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners, for uh, keeping up with us. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Thanks also to our transcriptionist. Um, she didn't really want to be mentioned, but we appreciate her very much. Um, speaking of transcriptionists, we have transcriptions for every episode if you prefer to read rather than to listen. Like the opposite of Brian lately, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed this recording. See you next week. <laughs>